Hey everybody, this is Garrett with Earth and Time and today I'm taking you on a pretty unique adventure to go to one of my favorite museums uh, really in the U.S. and it's based here in Houston, Texas, not too far from where I live. Benjamin Franklin once said the only certainties are death and taxes and today we're going to cover one of those subjects and the first one. So we're going to talk about the history of funerals today and talk about some famous funerals including funerals for presidents as you can see and the sign over my head. So join me today to learn about the history of funerals, learn about some famous funerals, and learn about this unique part of life and how people have handled it throughout generations and millennia. So with that being said, let's get to it. I want to start us today with the presidential funerals. Although we're going to talk about the history of funerals in general, I think they have a great display here about some famous figures about their funerals and they even have uh, some special items here that I would like to share with you all. So let's go ahead and start by learning a little bit about presidential funerals and then we're going to go back in time and talk about funerals throughout the ages. And as I walk in here, one of the things I want to share with you is the funeral of Abraham Lincoln and they actually have a really nice display on this. and. Before we get into the overall history, I think this is a nice example of how funerals were handled back in the 1800s and kind of sets the stage for us to understand funerals as a whole. And because I think pretty much everybody knows Abraham Lincoln, I thought this was a good place to start. Now, most people know Abraham Lincoln was the 16th president of the United States, served during the Civil War. He's born February 12th, 1809, one of the reasons we celebrate President's Day in February, along, of course, with Washington's birthday. But he passed away April 15th, 1865, uh, where he was shot, shot by John Wilkes Booth. And what they have here are a number of pretty unique items associated with his funeral. They have items like the actual mourning badge somebody wore during Lincoln's funeral. They also have a replica of the gun that shot Abraham Lincoln, which is pretty small. They actually have a newspaper from April 15th, 1865, talking about the death of Abraham Lincoln. They actually have a flag remnant from his funeral tour. And this is fascinating. They have one of 10 pieces of hair or locks of hair from Abraham Lincoln that still survives. Pretty fascinating to think. And that little locket there is a piece of Abraham Lincoln's hair. Definitely not something you get to see at any museum or at very many places. In fact, they said there's only 10 of these that exist. Now, this is the... Uh, replica of Abraham Lincoln death mask post assassination. So I don't know the story on the death mask. Let me see if I can find more about that or if people know more, they can put some information about that below. But this is a replica of that death mask. So when we talk about funerals, we have to talk about how do people mourn? And in this case, I've shown you a few examples of how mourning occurred. They wore the badges of mourning. They also did a tour on a train similar to this replica where they took Abraham Lincoln across much of the US which allowed people from across the country to mourn and pay their respects after his passing and this is a nice diorama showing what that would have looked like and here's more about that funeral train route so starting in Washington, D.C., he was laid there from April 15th to the 21st. And you can see he moved to Baltimore, Maryland, and he went all the way eventually to Springfield, Illinois by May 3rd and 4th, 1865. And here's the map showing that progression coming across starting in Washington, D.C. I'm going to point on here and then working their way up over and across this portion of the United States. And I apologize about the glare. Eventually ending up in Springfield, Illinois. Here is a replica of what 
the viewing would have looked like for Abraham Lincoln. You would have had an honor guard. And then you had this amazingly adorned casket and they have a replica of Abraham Lincoln in it. It was six feet, six inches and about one and a half feet wide, it says. And at the time cost about $1,500, which in today's dollars, I imagine would be tens of thousands. Now, when we go talk about Victorian funerals, once we visit that part of the of the museum, you'll see this style was, I believe, more popular during that time, including the draping of the black around the picture frame of the deceased. Lincoln was finally laid to rest in the tomb in October 15th, 1874 in Arlington National Cemetery. And this is what the inside of the tomb looks like down below. And if any of you ever visited there, please let me know down in the comments. This is a pretty amazing exhibit and really gives you an idea how back in the 1800s they handled the funeral of a president of the United States. Let's go now and work our way over to learn more about the history of funerals and how different cultures have dealt with them through the millennia. And then let's come back here and talk about some of the other presidential funerals as well. So there's really two ways that I understand, and I guess three ways, that when somebody passes, especially in the, as we think about it, that bodies can be prepared for burial. In the old world, a lot of that was done through cremation or just through burying. And of course, in the new world, more modern times, you can talk about the process of embalming. So I'm going to start by learning a little bit more about the process of cremation. It sounds like, of course, that's been around for a really long time. Probably the safest and easiest way to dispose really of a body or pay respects to a body that also helped protect the community was through something like cremation or you'd have to find somewhere far away from things like water sources, food sources, and the general population to put those bodies to rest, however that was. And of course with fire, that was probably the, the, one of the safest and easiest ways for people to do that and still honor uh, their loved ones and others who've passed away. So let's learn a little bit more about this process of cremation through the millennia. So coming back to this map, I started talking about this subject with, they actually have a video on the other side of this panel. Um, I'm not gonna sit there and play the whole video, but what they do is they talk about where they found evidence through cremation through time. What they found, at least in ancient Greece and Rome and Egypt, are and even in some indigenous sites in the Americas, as well as in China, they found urns and different types of vessels that contain ash associated with the final resting places of the deceased. And this map really gives you an idea about all the places they found evidence for cremation, all the way from A up here in Alaska with Paleo Indians circa 11,500 BC to going over to Australia where they found remains, archeological remains from 30,000 BC. This says the ancient Romans built underground tombs with recesses in their walls for placing the urns. And here's an example of one of those from a publication showing how individuals would place their family members, loved ones, etc., into these recesses within what was called a columbarium the Latin for the word dove. 
which of course the dove, the columba, is so named due to its resemblance to a dovecote or resting place for doves, which are also symbols of everlasting spirit. Huh. That's where the whole idea of the peaceful dove comes from. I had no idea. So I mentioned they have a video here where they talked about all the places in the world that, that archaeologists have found evidence for cremations. I'm not going to sit here and play the whole video, but it's pretty interesting that you can see they're talking about the different areas around the world. Now here in the United States, the first crematorium was actually built in 1876 by Dr. Julius Lemoyne. And what they've done here is they've made an exact replica of that original crematorium here within the museum. And they said from 1876 to 1901, there were 41 cremations that took place. So it says that this brick what they called crematory is an exact replica of the very first one in the United States. And here's some interesting information. Cremation by the numbers, U.S. cremations by state. It's interesting, depending on where you live, depends on if you're being cremated or not. Notice that Nevada even in 2008, it was over 70% of people were cremated. And when you look at 2017, it's gone up quite significantly. And if we look at internationally, the statistics from 2016, get an idea there's a lot of places that are actually quite a few that are over 50% including places like Australia almost 70% and New Zealand at over 70% that do cremations really interesting so as I'm walking through this area and sharing the history and a little bit about learning about cremation. It's hitting pretty close to home for me right now. I just recently lost my father uh, this year and we actually went through this process with him um, to be cremated. So it's hit me a little bit when I'm in here, but I'm also, it helps me understand the process better, even though as part of those conversations to come here and visit and learn more about it, it actually brings me a bit of comfort and more understanding um, to that closure for me. So, all right, with that being said, let's keep learning more about the history of funerals. And let's move over now into how people preserve bodies in a different way. We talk about cremation. Let's now talk about, well, if we want to bury a body, you need to do something special to bury bodies. Otherwise they can decompose, uh, they can carry disease. There's other things that can happen. So that's always been a risk when dealing with people that pass. So how did people first start figuring out how to deal with the deceased in a way that would be safe for the greater community? And really to talk about that, we really have to go back to ancient Egypt, who, as we all know, and are, everybody's pretty much familiar with mummies, we can start talking about the embalming process and how it actually started there and they actually had a god dedicated just to that, Anubis, the Egyptian god of embalming. They have a really nice display here talking about the idea that the Egyptians were some of the first people to really think about this idea, or at least record they thought about this idea in a lot of detail, really about what do we do with the body, what could happen in the afterlife. And so this really drove them to understand the idea of how to prepare a body after somebody passed away and they came up with this concept of embalming or preserving the body for basically in their view for all time and they talk about some of the ways that they did this from having um, of course 
large ceremonial or tomb sites to the sarcophagi to the pyramids and to actually have a replica of what they think the table would have looked like where they would have mummified somebody and you can see Anubis on the back wall and I think the mask in the upper corner representing maybe a priest of Anubis who would have been those who would have prepared the body for entombment. So by around 2600 BC, the Egyptians started the process of embalming or mummification with success. It sounds like before that time, they weren't as successful at doing that. And really what it came down to is starting to, of course, drain the body of fluids and remove organs. And they would bury those separately from the body. And that seemed to aid in the mummification process or the preservation process. Now from the Egyptians, let's fast forward a few thousand years and come to Dr. Thomas Holmes, father of American embalming. Dr. Holmes, 1817 to 1899, was a mortician often called the father of American embalming. Embalming really became a popular way to preserve the bodies really because of the Civil War where Dr. Holmes would embalm bodies of Union soldiers and officers so they can preserve them and ship them back to their families for burial at home. And he said he had claimed to have embalmed 4,000 soldiers and officers, field and staff. That being said, they have a special exhibit here just on the embalming during the Civil War. So this is the time because the soldiers were so far from home and of course transportation wasn't really quick, although getting quicker with the invention of the railways and the extent of the railways. The idea was to preserve the bodies for as long as they could so they can make it home. And here's an example of a Civil War embalming. And here's an actual example of somebody named Richard Burr who I believe was serving in the Eastern Front we just learned about from 1861. And this is a recreation of that photo. And you'll see him using the pumping tube to drain out the fluids and then replace those with embalming fluids that we can see here to the left hand side. Would have been a pretty rudimentary way and set up to do this out, especially along the battlefields or along the different fronts. So we fast forward a little bit farther, we can start thinking about uh, the Old West and cowboys and the old ghost towns and the idea of what some things like a coffin would look like during that time, just kind of a fairly basic coffin in the shape that all of us are pretty familiar with for a coffin, probably made out of pine or other kinds of wood that have been local to the area. And you can see the hearse that would have carried the body. So the idea of processions and hearses in a way to carry the body is something that's carried throughout history, including even during the time of the Egyptians, when we were learning about them in this area, they would actually have processions as well that would take the bodies from where they're being embalmed and then lay them to rest as a procession and a celebration as well. A bit about embalming during the Civil War and even during the really the Old West time, time of the Cowboys. So let's talk a little bit about how mourning took place, especially if you think about the Victorian time. And we did see some examples of that already when we looked at Abraham Lincoln's funeral display. So what they've done at the museum is they've recreated what a wake would have looked like during the Victorian era, basically the 1800s, middle to late 1800s. And you get an idea about what a funeral would have looked like during that time or a wake and actually this would have been an extended event somewhere around three days where they would have the individual in the parlor so family friends could come visit and say their goodbyes what is fascinating about this is there seems to be a lot of 
I guess superstitions or ideas associated with with how to handle the wake and what's happening including this is what's called a door badge which covers the doorbell or knocker and I guess this is a great piece for the family so they don't have to continually answer doors being knocked or if they're knocked it's quiet I couldn't find much else about this idea of these door badges but if people know more please let me know down below now you'll see as part of the wake they've they've draped the portrait of the individual who passed in black much like we saw at the Abraham Lincoln wake and they've covered the mirror in black as well which I find fascinating and I'd be curious about if others know more about the story of during the wake why you'd cover the mirror in black maybe it's so you don't see yourself in there or maybe it has something to do with the soul I'd be really curious and they have what are called morning shadow boxes which was a practice of making morning jewelry out of the deceased hair was pretty common in the 19th century and so they'd have this display and then you can see ribbons of their hair as part of or as the flower display in there and here's more about the morning badges that we saw at Abraham Lincoln's funeral as well. They wore these morning badges and they had names on like a pallbearer or just a black ribbon of some sort. And then, of course, she had the different outfits or morning outfits and morning dresses. And it says these are circa 1864, so towards the end of the Civil War. And I apologize about some of the glare. Let me see if I can get us a different angle to look at some of these morning dresses. And you needed a way to not only transport the, the body of the deceased, but also the individuals going to the funeral and laying the body to rest. So this is an example of what was known as a widow's coach, a Kimball Broham 1888 carriage that would seat four people and be for the family of the deceased to travel in to their final resting place. Now that we've learned more about kind of the primary ways that bodies are, are dealt with after they pass, let's take a look at some of the funerals for maybe well-known individuals. So let's go take a look back at the President's Hall area. And then they also have a special exhibit here on how popes are buried as well. And they have a special memorial area to a number of famous individuals and they have some artifacts from them that I'd like to share with you all. So let's go start with the presidents and work our way around the rest of this museum. So coming back into the presidential area, they have information about President Harding's funeral, Texas native, Old Ike himself, Dwight D. Eisenhower, and some articles from his funeral and they have the presidential funeral hearse for both Ronald Reagan as well as for Gerald Ford here. So this presidential funeral hearse took both Ronald Reagan and President Ford, Gerald Ford, and laid them both to rest. And see a copy of the eulogy from George Washington's funeral. A diorama of JFK's funeral procession and the In Memoriam original pamphlet. And this is amazing. This is the original Eternal Flame that actually sat on JFK's grave from 1967 to 1998. They also have a section on celebrating the lives and deaths of the Pope. So let's learn a little bit about the funeral of the Pope. So this is a new one for me. This is the flag of the Vatican. 
And of course the Vatican is its own independent country. And I don't think I've ever seen the flag from there before. So I wanted to share that with you all. They have a series of articles about different popes and the articles that were published when they passed away. And you walk down this hallway to this room and it shows when a pope passes away, they have what are known as the Swiss Guard who are wearing those purple and orange outfits on either side and attendance, much like we saw with the attendance of the honor guard for Abraham Lincoln. There's an honor guard here who are part of the Swiss Guard. The Swiss Guard are, are the individuals who help protect the Vatican and they're there, of course, to this day. And here's a little bit about the Swiss Guard for anybody who's ever gone to the Vatican. Uh, I had the lucky occasion to be able to go to the Vatican. It was a fascinating and amazing experience. I was actually able to see some of the Swiss Guard while I was there. And it says on January 22nd, 1506, 150 Swiss soldiers commanded by Captain Caspar von Selinen of Canton Uri passed through the Puerta del Popolo and entered the Vatican for the very first time. There, they were blessed by Pope Julius II. The Swiss Guards have been protecting the Vatican for more than 500 years. They currently number just over 100 men and serve as the Pope's personal bodyguards. And here's a papal coffin. And you'll see they've made a, a recreation of one here. And you can take a look at the shape. It actually is very narrow at the feet and widens towards the head. And I did not realize the Papal Coffins. It's actually three layers. So you have the wooden casket, you have a lead casket, and then you finally have an external casket. Interesting. And this would be an example of where somebody like John Paul would have been buried in something like this or was a recreation of where he's entombed. You know, I've never really thought about how a Pope would be buried before, but that was really fascinating. There's a lot of information there and a lot more information than I can cover for you all. So now where I've gone through is now I'm in what's known as the international area that talks about how different cultures handle Funeral. So let's see if we can learn a little bit more about how different places in the world celebrate the passing of a loved one or have a celebration of life or how they mourn, and what celebrations or mourning processes take place. Probably the most familiar for most of us, especially here in Texas or in the southwestern U.S., is the celebration of Dia de los Muertos or the Day of the Dead. And this is a nice example of how individuals who celebrate that holiday celebrate it. Including showing an example of an ofrenda. How a cemetery or graveyard would be decorated during Dia de las Muertas or Day of the Dead. That's a nice example of that here including showing a video what they call Papa Picado which are these paper decorations you'll see I rotate around slowly they have decorating all over the top here so the celebration of the Day of the Dead actually precedes the Spanish conquistadors coming to this area it says it originates from ancient civilizations. They also have information about the Japanese funeral. And they have a vehicle that's a little bit more, I guess, semi-modern. But look at that decoration on top. And this would have been a 1972 Japanese ceremonial hearse. And that is pretty amazing. And these 
are coffins from Ghana. There's a gentleman named Kane Kuiye, and he built these coffins that look like animals or individuals' favorite things. And they remind me a lot of kind of almost totems, but from Ghana, these are coffins. Isn't that amazing? Wow. Even an airplane. Go take a look at one last place, and that is really looking at those who've already passed and some of the articles and artifacts that they have there. All right, thanks for the memories. And you'll see right off the bat as we come in here, they have pictures of some pretty well-known people like Elvis Presley and Charlie Dan Daniels, including, I wonder if it's a fiddle that he actually signed. Pretty cool. Gene Wilder and his hat from Willy Wonka. And I love that they have a section to famous animals that you can see down here. They just showed Old Yeller. I see you'll see. There's Kiko from Free Willy. There's PD from Little Rascals. Oh, that's fun. Terrier Toto. That was Toto from Wizard of Oz. Oh. Uh, Walt Disney, and they have a whole section here, not just on Walt Disney, but the idea of Snow White. And it was a cartoon where they actually showed a glass casket that she was in. Pretty interesting display that they have here for Walt Disney. They have a whole section on what's known as the 27 Club. For those of you who are not familiar, there was a number of musicians that died at the age of 27. And those include more modern Amy Winehouse, people like Janis Joplin, Kurt Cobain, Jim Morrison, Jimi Hendrix, Brian Jones, and Robert Johnson all passed away at the age of 27 and all were known as amazing musicians. They have a section on the famous Cowboys, John Wayne, Gene Autry, Clay Moore, Roy Rogers, Dale Evans, Tom Mix. And it's almost that time of year. Halloween's just around the corner and here's suspense and thrillers. You have Lon Chaney, who is famous as, of course, the Wolfman. You have Basil Rathbone and Sherlock Holmes. I used to watch those Sherlock Holmes with my grandfather. Of course, Vincent Price, Fred Gwynn, Ben Chapman, and actually some of my favorite, Bella Lugosi, there's Alfred Hitchcock, and Boris Karloff. A nice memorial to the actors and directors and creators of some of the most well-known suspense and thrillers. They have lots and lots of memorabilia and really Talk about a number of individuals who've been influential in everything from culture to science to sports. They even have a section here on jazz funerals. So in New Orleans, a funeral is a celebration of life and music is a great way to mourn and they have a whole exhibit here about how in New Orleans they do that. All right, everybody. Thank you so much for joining me today here at the Funeral History Museum in Houston, Texas. If you get a chance to come here, it's well worth the $15 to get in. There's so much to see, so much to learn, and it really covers so many topics. There's history and fascination and superstition and cultural aspects and you're going to learn something new here uh, when it comes to this idea of funeral history and how different cultures and different people deal with death something that we all have to deal with at some point if you enjoyed this video please 
give it a thumbs up. Please leave comments down below. I'd like to know what you think. If you have some other ideas about video locations you'd like me to check out in Texas and or beyond, please let me know. If you haven't already, please subscribe to my channel. I appreciate having you all along to learn with me. I learn something new every time I go out and I hope you do as well. So I enjoy bringing you along for that. And uh, with that being said, I hope you all take care and we're out of here. Thanks for joining me today.